So welcome um, those who are with us so far on our Sunday afternoon Zoom and catch up um, and um, talking about the, what's happening in Israel and uh, for those who can stay on after the uh, 5.30 time limit, we'll have some prayer for uh, those in Israel and those that are our friends. So this afternoon um, we've invited um, uh, uh, a person I've just met, um, Dr. Brent Car Carlo. Um, met Brent uh, during last week as he was a, a guest on um, uh, our regular SCAFI monthly mis uh, meetings, Southern Cross Alliance for Israel meetings, and um, just really enjoyed what he had to share. Um, so I invited him to come on this afternoon and to share a little bit with him with us and to have a Q&A session with him. Uh, I'm hoping that those who did get the um, the invitation by um, by email also got the link and may have had an opportunity to um, see the recording if they weren't live on the SCAFI meeting last Tuesday. Um, but it was a, a wonderful meeting and, and Bren is a historian. He, he's a member of the ZFA. Um, he spent time in a kibbutz in Israel, um, and I believe, uh, I didn't know this beforehand, Bren, but I believe that you know uh, Atan from many years uh, back as well. And so uh, I just want to say welcome, and Atan's going to um, uh, say hello to everybody first, and then um, uh, we'll get into some questions. And I think Atan's got a couple to start with. Uh, to lead you on, but then we want to talk about what's happening in the north, and uh, hopefully others will be able to ask some questions as well as to um, as to what's happening over there at the moment. So welcome to all that are with us on this Sunday afternoon, and over to you, Atan. Thank you, thank you, John. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining uh, this uh, weekly session uh, joint venture between. Uh, the Kingdom Builders uh, and the, the worldwide uh, Israeli diasporic organization, uh, the Global Israeli Leadership, uh, that uh, in, in a way takes this weekly session not only here in Australia, but also in the German-speaking countries um, in, uh, in a weekly sort of rhythm uh, to our website and to uh, the YouTube channel of Global Israeli Leadership, the sessions uh, from time to time are shown, are shown also uh, to Israelis. Um, a very interesting, uh, I would say, sessions that uh, takes us uh, from uh, families of the kidnapped uh, uh, through politicians, uh, through officers or former officers in the army, experts, like Bren, are also part of it. And uh, I, uh, first of all, would like to welcome Bren. Uh, always spontaneous uh, approach is, is good because uh, you have it fresh without preparation, but you are uh, someone for sure on Australian soil that walks on the footsteps of Moses, I would say. And uh, you are, uh, uh, don't be embarrassed, but uh, I know a lot about you progress since you've been to Israel and uh, and uh, absolutely a great voice for Zionism, a great voice for the Israeli point of view and uh, what we call the voice of Shofar for the community. So uh, I would like to thank you very much uh, for joining. And if John would give me the permission, um, I will ask you the first uh, question that probably will take us. And by the way, uh, just to give you a, a heads on, is uh, that the next week uh, on Sunday, we'll have uh, the head of, I would say, foreign affairs and, uh, and public diplomacy for the alternative, one of the alternative Palestinian leadership uh, for after the war. His name is uh, Seymour uh, Sijawi a very good friend who lives in Jerusalem and is, uh, uh, in a way, one of uh, Dachlan, Muhammad Dachlan's 
senior assistants and uh, it will be a very interesting uh, session and I think it will be worthwhile that uh, uh, you will be there as well. Next Sunday, you're invited already now uh, to listen, to learn, and to hear a different uh, version of Palestinian initiative. So uh, if John would give me the permission, I will ask you the qu first question. In fact, is a question that I am not originally uh, the initiative of it, but uh, 2010 it was A.B. Joshua or Joshua, the late author, who asked the question and tried to answer it. Uh, and after the session, I will send you his uh, column that takes me along, uh, but it would be very worthwhile to hear your opinion about it. Uh, so if John will give me the permission, I'll ask the question. Hey, go ahead. Um, <laughs> go ahead, Atan. Thank you. Thank you. So the question is why the Israeli-Palestinian conflict refuses to be resolved? <laughs> well, if you've got 76 years, I can um, <laughs> I, I can let you know. Let me, let me just start. Um, Etan, it's good to see you again. Um, good to see you. Many years ago, I went to Israel on a scholarship that was sponsored by the Australian Friends of Hebrew University. Um, Etan was, was the head of the Australian Friends back then. I'm not sure if you're still involved with Hebrew University, but, um, but that was how our connection began. That scholarship was in... 2002 or 2004 or something like that so it's been a while but um but that's how we know each other so how is it um actually this it's a great question because um and i'm very happy to delve into it because really the heart of my phd tackled this you know when you when you start a phd all the experts and the people from universities they say look you need to pick a niche topic as, as specific as you can possibly get. That's the that's what a successful PhD is about. And so I so, so my topic was why is the Israeli-Palestinian dispute so hard to resolve? Uh, but the answer I came up with, the, the short version is uh, when most people um, think of violent conflict, including the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians. Um, and particularly when they think of how to resolve those conflicts, they think of territory and resources. And basically, if there are two warring parties that want the same land, then you've got to find a way that they can either share the territory between them or divide the territory between them. And ultimately, that's the way to resolve conflict. And in most conflicts, that is the way to resolve conflict. It might be very hard to do that, but ultimately, that's the path that that is done. And those the, the land or the resources or in some in independence movements, it's share of autonomy or independence or things like that. Israeli-Palestinian dispute is somewhat different. And it's not unique, but it is, but um, there, there are few conflicts, I think, that are similar to it. The reason it's different is because there are people on both sides that do not want to share or divide the land at all. They want the entirety of the land for themselves. Now, most of these people are um, driven by religious reasons. God gave us the land. It's ours. No one else has a right to it. There are, of course, interpretations of both Judaism and, and Islam um, that, um, that, you know, where, where the adherents of those religions can, can, um, can come up with that formula. Um, and so they say, well, look, it's our land. And so therefore, Palestinians shouldn't have a state. And the Palestinians can say the same thing about the Jews. So if, if these people on each side who, who absolutely never wanted to divide the land, only numbered 5%, 1%, 10% of the people, then they would be a problem, but you could ultimately work around them. But because there are substantial numbers of people on both sides that do not want to divide the land ever. And we're not talking about because they don't trust the other side. We're talking about they just absolutely flat out never want to give the land to the other side or parts of the land to the other side. Um, because there are so many of them, then they can um, then they, they can act as spoilers. They can prevent peace tr from occurring. Um, and, and how they act as spoilers, whether it's through democratic processes or violent processes, 
Um, and we saw it in the 1990s during the peace process where more Israelis died as a result of terrorism during the peace process, uh, which was seven years long, than in any other preceding seven-year period. Um, terrorism increased during the peace process. Um, we saw the number of settlers dramatically increase during the peace process because the settlers, or particularly people, uh, a lot of the people behind the settler movement, absolutely don't want to divide the land with the Palestinians, and so therefore did their best to to dramatically increase the number of settlers. Um, Yitzhak Rabin was murdered by someone who absolutely never wanted Israel to share or divide the land with the Palestinians. So ultimately that's, I mean, you know, there's all these things are complicated with lots of overlapping reasons, but when you boil down to it, the idea that some Israelis and some Palestinians are willing to divide the land for peace, they might not want to, of course, they might not trust the other side, but they're willing to in principle. Whereas there are also some Israelis and some Palestinians that absolutely never want to divide the land um, and they can act as spoilers. So ultimately, that's the reason that there's no peace. Now, the next question would be, well, how can we fix this? If we do want Israeli-Palestinian peace, how can we do this? Um, there are, if you like, uh, I guess, there are numerous versions of Israeli-Palestinian peace, okay? There could be a one-state solution where everyone, um, there, is, there is no Israel or there is no Palestine, or at least there's no nationalist or ethnocentric country where it's a Jewish state or an Arab state. It's just a state of its people. Everyone gets a singular vote. The problem is the majority of people in both communities don't want that outcome. They have lived and died and killed for many years in order to have or retain their ethnocentric state. So, no, so the majority aren't going to agree to that outcome. You could have the status quo remaining where Israel retains overall control of, of the area and the Palestinians have limited authority. That's a status quo um, that has been relatively stable for the past 20 years, but ultimately um, is unstable because the overwhelming majority of Palestinians don't want that outcome. And they will put up with it for a while and then they will act against it. Um, you could have a two-state outcome, negotiations. That's sort of the ideal that most people want. But of course, the negotiations and, have proven so hard over the last 20 years. And of course, there's ethnic cleansing. Um, Israel has the military capacity to ethnically cleanse the Palestinians, push them, either murder them all or push them completely out of, of the territories and have the area only Jewish. But of course, Israel doesn't do that and doesn't want to do that. There might be a handful of Israelis that do want to do that, but they don't have... Um, don't have the guns and they won't they won't do it that's it's not a it's not a realistic scenario on the other side the palestinians could ethnically cleanse the jews um, certainly there are many palestinians who would want that outcome but they don't have and we saw frankly 7th of october was was an example of them trying to ethnically cleanse the jews there were genocidal actions um, but of course they don't have the military capacity to ethnically cleanse the Jews because Israel is stronger than the Palestinian military capability. So if you have a look at all of these options that are available, the only ones that really are realistic is, or at least the most realistic, is the two-state outcome, which is why um, which is why most people push towards that or most people that want peace push towards that. Um, and and even if it's difficult, it's it's the most realistic to achieve. I sort of got off track. I wanted to say, well, how do we get to this state? And the, the way we get to this state is to make the international community realize that there is this existentialist part of the dispute, that there are people on both sides that want the entirety of the territory and will never want to divide it. We have to, if, if we do want peace and we do want to divide the territory, we need to reduce the number of people on each side that want this maximalist outcome um, through education, through well, through arresting them if they're if they're violently inclined, if they're terrorists, through through killing them or otherwise physically stopping them. But once these people are reduced to to a, a proportion of the population where they can no longer influence the people, or they no longer really have a veto over the peace process then there's a chance of successful peace. But that's a long way off, I think. Yeah, that's good. Thanks, uh, Bryn. Um, 
I can think of a dozen questions that are going to come out of that, but uh, let's hold them for a minute. Uh, I hope you're writing down your questions, people that you want to ask or comments. Um, uh, but Atan, you had two questions. Yes, so yes. Let's, yes let's thank get you. Get the second one. I think I think uh, the second question reflects on uh, on Brent's uh, analysis now, and uh, what uh, I would like uh, to ask you is. Uh, you know, uh, in 2014, you had leftist centralists saying uh, to uh, that time also Prime Minister Netanyahu and to his, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Minister for Defense at the time, Yalon, to and Gantz, if I'm not mistaken, was the chief of staff, uh, to march on and eliminate the Hamas, eliminate the Hamas already 10 years ago, and uh, the voice was not heard. But in any case, what uh, I would like to ask you is, uh, in this point of time, do you think there is a place for negotiation or should we now eliminate the Hamas completely when we hear a different Palestinian groups who are saying uh, tomorrow we'll include the Hamas? Can you elaborate on that? It's a very difficult question. Um... It's impossible for me to answer that question in a way, but I can perhaps um, pull at some of the threads of the complexities of it. And the place of negotiation, um, the first, uh, Bren, and the place of negotiation. The, well, the first thread is, what does eliminate Hamas mean, right? Um, in Second World War, the Allies didn't eliminate Nazism. There were still Nazis around. There's not many of them, but there's still Nazis around. The, the Allies didn't defeat fascism. But they beat they what they did do is comprehensively beat the fascist government. Um, and they replaced that fascist government with another government. And they well, there are still there are still tens of thousands of US troops in Germany to make sure that they, you know they they, they 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 might not need to be there any longer, but they they were initially there for the decades after the Second World War to make sure that a fascist government didn't didn't come back. So Hamas is a movement. You cannot defeat Hamas the movement. You cannot uh, extinguish that. And what is that movement? That movement of Hamas is what I was just talking about in my last answer, which is the religious desire to replace Israel with an Islamist Palestinian state. You can't, through, through many years, through education, through all sorts of things, perhaps that extremist um, exterminationist movement can be replaced within Palestinian society, but Israeli arms can't defeat the movement. What Israel can do is defeat the Hamas government and completely kick it out. Arguably, Israel has already done that. Um, the Hamas government in Gaza does not function any longer at all, right? Um, the Hamas, for, for, the, for the first, even though, you know, even though they were using... Um, the, the the Hamas fighters were, were breaking all the relevant laws of armed conflict. Um, they were they were an organized, they were but a state like organized army that were um, that were fighting Israel. Now that is starting to turn into guerrilla warfare because they're finished as a as a state like entity. Um, so now the question is, but now so. Again, how do you measure what defeat? Does defeating Hamas mean uh, killing uh, Ismail Haniya or um, or Yahya Sinwa or or uh, Mohammed Daif? Um, is that eliminating the Hamas? If that's if that's the case, then Israel hasn't achieved its 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 uh, its objectives. Is is the objective of the you know very quickly the objective of the war became returning the hostages? Israel hasn't achieved that objective either. Um, so, uh, arguably, if, well, well, sadly, but, but quite probably, Israel is not going to secure the return of the hostages only through military pressure. There has to be some kind of agreement to have those hostages returned. However, Hamas is not going to sign any agreement that, um, 
that sees it leave Gaza. Like if the agreement is, okay, Hamas is finished, you can all go to Qatar or Turkey or the rest of it. Oh, Hamas okay. is not going to sign that. They won't want to. So, so a ceasefire deal or, or an agreement that Israel signs that sees the return of the hostages will see um, uh, Hamas leaders or, or Hamas people retain in Gaza. And I don't, I don't, presumably that won't mean that Hamas government stays because Israel is not going to sign an agreement that says that Hamas government stays in power. But, you know, it's hard. Um, but the, alter, the, the other thing, though, is even though Israel has comprehensively destroyed the Hamas government, it hasn't come up with a day after plan. Or if it has come up with a day after plan, then it hasn't, it hasn't sort of announced it. So there is currently, I mean, yes, they're, they're finishing the operation in Rafah, and once Rafah is sort of done, then they'll say, okay, we've, we've destroyed the Hamas government. But, um, but then what? If Israel just stays there um, as an occupying power, then that's, you know, then, then, then that's a possibility, but that will, there'll be lots of guerrilla warfare actions, there'll be lots of Israeli soldiers dying through these guerrilla actions, um, and ultimately, you can't win. You can't win those wars, and ultimately Israel will leave, and it will be a victory for the violence. Um, so, you know, and politically Israel may well say, "Well, look, we've defeated Hamas. We'll, we'll get a replacement Palestinian government in, whether it's a Palestinian Authority or international forces such as the UAE or something." Uh, and then, you know, we'll sign the agreement. We'll say we're finished. We'll take our hostages home, and then Israel will reclaim victory. But you know, if the Palestinian leadership crawls out of a tunnel and waves a Palestinian flag, then that's also going to be victory for them as well. So there's there's no there's no good answer uh, to that question. No no possible answer in a way. No, well, I think uh, you gave as much as you can comprehensively a, a reply that gives the impression how difficult uh, the situation is. Uh, and uh, John, please go ahead with questions from others and later on. I'll slot myself in about the north. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> um, well, we've started with all the hard questions, um, um, Bryn, um, but perhaps it might be an idea for you to give sort of uh, two or three or four minutes on, you know, you're now living in Melbourne, I, as I understand it. Um, you had time in Israel. You... Um, um, perhaps a little bit of your family and your background as to where you are and what you're doing now would be good for others to understand. Sure. Well, my mum's uh, here in the conversation, so, so, um, so, so you know, clearly I have a fantastic mum. Uh, <laughs> um, no, I. Uh, so my background is um, I grew up in a strongly Christian Zionist household. Um, I was taken to Israel by my parents when I was 14 and really fell in love with the place. And I returned, I think I was 19 when I returned to be a um, 20, to be a volunteer on the kibbutz. And so I lived on the kibbutz uh, in the north of Israel for about two and a half years. Loved it. Um, and then and then I came to Australia to do university, went back to Israel to do um finish off my bachelor there then I did my honours thesis there I came back here so I've sort of been back and forth for a little while I've I lived in Israel for a total of six years over a nine-year period um from the late 90s through the um to about 2006 um and then since then I've I've, I've been working both for Jewish community organizations I did my time in uh, in DFAT and other Australian public service organizations as well um I did a PhD along the way um, and so now I do, um, I'm a director of public affairs at the Zions Federation of Australia, which is one of Australia's two um, representative peak bodies of the Australian Jewish community. Now you're on mute, John. Uh, you, um, so your mum's with us, which is wonderful. Um, uh, are you married or any of that sort of um, thing at the moment? I am. I have a, a family here in Melbourne. Um, Two wonderful kids, wonderful wife. Wonderful. That's good. Good to know. Um, interesting as we were um, finding a li little bit more out, out about you, uh, it was interesting you you spent some time at um, the kibbutz in the north. So which kibbutz were you at? 
is Russia Nikra, which is uh, which is on the border of Lebanon and also on the coast, so right in the northwest corner of the country. Wow. Okay. And that a good experience. Tell us a, a little bit about that experience. That's great. Um, I worked in the dairy the entire time there, so early mornings, but um, you know, good hard work and um, made a lot of friends. Um, very different experience from suburban, you know, Melbourne or, or Darwin where I grew up, but. Um, it's a great village life. It's a really um, wonderful place. Of course, it's empty now. It's been evacuated. Don't forget, don't yeah. forget that Brent, Brent spent time on the eve of the uh, Second Lebanon War on the border uh, 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 at the no, time I, um, on the Russian Cup. No, no, I wasn't. Um, I wasn't there. Uh, did you say you did? Or, or you I, did. You did. No, you no, no, no. I was in Russian in the late nineties. I left in ninety nine. Oh. Um, Israel was still in southern Lebanon while I was there. So every now and then um, would would sort of stand on the hill and watch the the Katusha rockets landing on our fields beneath the beneath the kibbutz. But um, but no, I, I wasn't there during the um, well. I was in I was in from what two thousand and two, and then again from two, about two thousand and four, two thousand five, two thousand six. I was in Jerusalem. I wasn't up on the kibbutz. Right. By the um, way, uh, by the way, Bren, uh, John. For one sec, uh, on the eve of, uh, uh, in a way, not on the eve, on the morning of uh, of July, um, if I'm not mistaken, six, uh, in 2006, um, came to me a, a movie maker uh, from uh, Melbourne, uh, who used to live in Menton, by the name of Dr. Jonathan Messer. Uh, I promise to bring Jonathan to complete your presentation today because Jonathan went uh, with his saving of ten thousand US dollars uh, to Israel and asked me to bring him to the um, what you call the uh, leading vehicle of the head of the Galilee Formation, the Brigadier General Gal Hirsch, and he made uh, twenty-eight hours of footage mainly uh, to follow the families of Goldwasser and Regev uh, along the first few days of the war. He also was under fire with the troops, and Jonathan has not yet completed the film. He wants to do it now 20 years uh, after the war and, and put it across uh, to sell it. Uh, and I think uh, it be worthwhile to invite him, John, uh, to speak to us and tell about his experience in Lebanon, very relevant uh, at the moment. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but uh, I think it would be worthwhile, John, if you present uh, Bren with uh, your questions about the North and how she yep. sees it. Yeah. So uh, that sort of led to the questions, you know, and the times you were up in the North, which were much quieter times, um, and now we've seen what is happening in the north and uh, what's happened since October the 7th with some 80,000 people being uh, removed and uh, evacuated into hotels and still are not able to go back. And uh, our observations or what we hear, uh, Bryn, is uh, that it's getting uh, tougher and harder and uh, the north is really, inverted commas, lighting up uh, with increased warfare. Uh, what are your observations about what is happening and what is likely to happen at this particular point of time? Well, the situation is very difficult. To to take a step back, um, Israel, everyone everyone knew the threats uh, and the objectives of, of Hezbollah and Hamas, right, for a long time. They both religiously wanted to uh, militarily destroy Israel, right, for religious reasons. Everyone knew that um, and everyone kind of ignored it because they... They didn't think that that they could do much about it. Every couple of years in Gaza, um, there was a war, and in each war, um, Israel degraded Hamas's military capabilities, um, but didn't but didn't remove Hamas from Gaza, which is of course different from from the current war. Seventh um, of October made Israel realize that the threat that these two organizations posed um well not was real but but um that their ability to carry out their objectives was was much more um real much more dangerous than israel had given credit for 
which is why Israel is now removing Hamas from power in Gaza. But the problem with, with Hezbollah in the north is Hezbollah wants the same thing. They are in much more militarily powerful than Hamas. Um, and so... And so Israel is in a situation where strategically it needs it needs Hezbollah removed from its northern border in order to be secure, because it it assumes that Hezbollah will want to do what Hamas does and obviously has the capability of doing it. Um, immediately after, as you said, John, immediately after the 7th of October, Israel evacuated um, 70 or 80,000 Israelis from the north of Israel, from like the 10 kilometers um, of the border. Um, and that was to prevent mass casualty incidents should Hezbollah invade. Um, because back on the 7th or 8th of October, people were kind of expecting Hezbollah to join to join the war. Um, now, 60,000 of those Israelis remain evacuated, uh, coming up to nine months after uh, after the war started. And this is... It's, it's an untenable situation because the idea that Israel has evacuated 60,000 of its people and they remain evacuated is, is, a, is a massive military victory for Hezbollah. Um, and it, it, this situation can't go on. So Israel, going back to scenarios, Israel has a number of scenarios here. It can keep its northern 10 kilometers basically evacuated. Uh, which is a victory for Hezbollah. And frankly, no country can or should allow that to happen. Um, or the international community could find a way to remove Hezbollah from the northern border, um, so therefore allow Israel to um, move its citizens back and, and, and remove the um, immediate threat of warfare. Or Israel could move Hezbollah away from the northern border, which obviously is warfare. Um, so Israel, if you like, has been in a holding pattern in the north for, for the last nine months because it's been fighting, it's been fighting in Gaza. But now the main operations in Gaza are uh, finishing, and so which is why, and, and at the same time, things are escalating in the north, and both Hezbollah and Israel are escalating their strikes and counter strikes in the north. Now, um. There is an international diplomatic effort to remove Hezbollah from the border. Um, there's an American um, called Amos Hochstein, uh, who is the you know the U.S. envoy who is trying to negotiate something. I personally I can't see it working because because Hezbollah, unlike you know Israel, which wants to protect its civilians in the north, Hezbollah has no. Um, like Hamas, they don't particularly care if their civilians are killed in warfare. And indeed, they see it as a strategic gain if their civilians are killed in warfare because they know that the West will put the pressure on, on Israel as a result. Um, and there's no, there's no credible threat that the international community can make in order to remove Hezbollah from the border. Um, look, in, in 2006, the UN Security Council Resolution 1701 um, said that, um, you know, that, that Hezbollah needs to, needs to leave. It, it gave UNIFIL, the UN Interim Force in Lebanon, um, the right to use all necessary means to remove Hezbollah from the border. And of course, the UN hasn't done anything. And there are no go zones in, in southern Lebanon where just Hezbollah will wave, you know, wave the UN away um so there's no so hezbollah doesn't doesn't believe anything that the international community does possibly i have no insight into this it's just a, it's just a guess possibly one of the reasons that israel is increasing the intensity or the magnitude of its strikes against hezbollah is to increase the threat which which provides that credibility for the international diplomatic movement so hezbollah can say okay maybe we'll move back but I don't know if that's going to work or not. I think a war in Lebanon to remove Hezbollah from the border will be terrible. It will be terrible for the South Lebanese. It will be terrible for Israelis in the north and for Israel generally. Um, it's not something, I don't believe it's not something that the Israeli government wants, the Israeli people want. 
However, the current situation where you've got Hezbollah on the on the northern border, um, willing and able to um, to invade Israel at any moment, and sixty thousand Israelis internally displaced as a result of the Hezbollah threat, it's an untenable situation. Uh, so, um, yeah. So I, I don't, yep. you know, I don't want to, I don't want to look into a crystal ball, but um, it's it, it's looking pretty dire at the moment. Yeah, not an easy, not an easy situation. And as we know from uh, some of our um, friends who are actually on the ground and in the IDF um, uh, and the reservists, etc., they've been put on notice that they'll be back in um, back in reserve uh, in the next month or so. Uh, so uh, not looking good, but it also leads yeah. on to yeah, it also leads on to the bigger question, um, and that's Iran and what what what's your what's your perspective there of of the bigger the the big unknown questions that's behind all the questions we've uh, asked so far. Yeah, well, absolutely, Iran. Um, Iran has Iran wants to be the regional hegemon. Um, it, it is seeking its long-term goal is to reduce and, ult and ultimately to remove U.S. Um, influence or U.S. presence from the Middle East. Um, Iran is waging, has, has, has cultivated highly successful proxies over many years. Um, you know, it founded Hezbollah in 1982. Um, it has been cultivating Hezbollah for that, for that amount of time. It has, it has proxies in Iraq, in Yemen, Hamas, it isn't is is in the Iranian sphere of influence. It's not a traditional proxy in that it wasn't created by Iran, but certainly it's in it's in Iran's sphere of influence. Um, and Iran is deploying these proxies against Israel. Now Israel is both an enemy of Iran because Iran um, doesn't like Israel, um, and the reason Iran doesn't like Israel, well. I've, I haven't read them myself, but I've been told that the original Iranian supreme leader, um, um, Khomeini, was particularly anti-Semitic and he, he particularly didn't like Jews or Israel. But there's a greater reason in that Iran is not trusted by the Middle East because it is Persian and it is Shia, whereas most of the Middle East is Sunni and Arab. So a way to gain... Um, a way to sort of bridge the differences between Iran and the Arab countries is to particularly target Israel because because the, most of the Arabs don't like Israel either, and so Iran is in the has always positioned itself as the vanguard in the fight against Israel, and it's a way to gain popularity. Um, but the other reason that Iran doesn't like Israel is Israel is seen as as a proxy of the West, and Israel is a proxy of the West, whether whether the West likes Israel or not. Israel is a proxy country of the West. It is Western. It holds Western values. It is supported by the leading Western country. Um, and this is a thing that I don't think is fully appreciated in the West, in that what happens in the Middle East is not necessarily sort of Iran versus Israel. Iran has placed the West into a strategic competition. It's like a Cold War situation. Um, Iran wants to remove Western influence from the Middle East it wants to, it has the capacity or it wants the increased capacity to damage trade, which will again will, will hurt Western interests and so on. I think it is in the West's strategic interest to make sure that the Iranian regime is undermined and to make sure that Iranian proxies are defeated. Now, during the Cold War, the West engaged in proxy warfare and some of those wars were nasty and some of the proxies that were used, you know, um, weren't particularly good, and and in hindsight, maybe we shouldn't have backed them. However, like it or not, we are engaged in a strategic competition with Iran, and I think that it is in the West's interest to make sure that our proxy in the Middle East, which includes Israel, there are other proxies we have, such as Egypt and Saudi Arabia, but now we're talking about Israel, to make sure that Israel beats in warfare Iranian proxies. And that includes Hamas, it includes Hezbollah. And so that's that's a sort of the big picture um, that is happening and that I wish was more appreciated in the West. I wanted to add uh, to it, uh, John um, and everybody. Um, 
you say the big picture, and I would say, wow. Brent, that uh, there is even a bigger picture because when you think about Lebanon, I mean, the joke of having a uh, Palestine national team playing against Australia in a qualifying match uh, uh, for the World Cup, or when I say a joke, because uh, with all the respect, uh, uh, sport is part of our life. Uh, you can see Euro now, and you know an amazing things uh, happened. You see Georgia was part of former Soviet Union, Slovenia, Slovakia, all over belong uh, before the Glasnost in 89 uh, to the Eastern Bloc, and they are now playing in free world. And we all, of course, pray one day to have a peace in the Middle East. But in principle, Lebanon is a sovereign country, and that's what I would say the, the largest picture is where France is in France is a major member in the European community. It's taking care of, uh, you mentioned, uh, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini uh, was in exile during the Shah leadership in France, hosted by uh, President Giscard d'Estaing. And, and when you think about the complication, they're really, I, I mean, you know, uh, if you remember uh, Rabbi Joseph Boog, the head of what he called the Zionist religious party, six governments serving the state of Israel, he used to say, if you want to understand the situation, you have before everything to be confused from the situation. And what I'd like to ask you is, how do you see Lebanon in that? And do you think that we should attack the southern Lebanese border or we should attack Beirut and north of Beirut? in order to shake the sovereignty of Lebanon and explain them that they are hosting a bloody proxy unit of Iran. The problem is Lebanon is a basket case. It is a failed state. Um, the Lebanese government has absolutely no ability to remove Hezbollah, to, to, to remove Hezbollah from, from, from Lebanon, to remove Hezbollah um, fighters from southern Lebanon or, or South Beirut. Um, I, you know, from a principled matter, yes, Israel should, you know, it could do that, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't actually make a difference and it would further damage Lebanon or the Lebanese government anyway. It was so. good that you answered that because the place of Lebanon in all these, and especially the special connection with Lebanon, with France, is something to always take into consideration because. France, in a way, is a stakeholder for Lebanon for many, many years. And how we deal with our good friend France, with all the Islam invading to Europe, etc., etc., how complicated the situation is. And uh, I hear you. I hear you. Very complicated. Yeah, look, it's it's the... Um, yeah, Lebanon was was for a while contested between sort of the various groups of interest in the Middle East. Saudi Arabia was vying for control and Lebanon, Iran was through Hezbollah. And Saudi Arabia gave, basically gave up, um, I think, and has, it has given over um, given over Lebanon to, to the Iranian sphere of influence and, and Hezbollah. But it's interesting, Hezbollah, and this is actually, I think, the model that Hamas will try and emulate in Gaza over the coming six months. Hezbollah does not want to rule Lebanon. Iran doesn't want to rule Lebanon. What, what Hezbollah has in Lebanon is, is veto power. Um, some, of it, some of its veto power is through its political engagement. Um, however, uh, its veto power is frankly through its, through its arms. Um, nothing will happen in Lebanon unless Hezbollah is okay with it happening. And they have murdered politicians, including, you know, the former prime minister. Um, they have murdered um, journalists. They have murdered business people. They've murdered judges because those people did things that that they knew Hezbollah didn't like, and so Hezbollah murdered them. I think in Gaza, that's what Hamas will be going for in the next six months. It's extremely dangerous. Uh, it's it's an easy trap for the West and the Palestinians and Israelis to fall into. It might even be an unavoidable trap. 
but I think Hezbollah, sorry, I think Hamas will not necessarily seek to to take back control of Gaza, at least not in the short to medium term. But I think that they will through their through their networks, through their through their gun men, will seek to basically have an effective veto over what happens in Gaza. Mm -hmm. Hi. Yep. Yep. It's yep. It's all in the we don't know basket at the moment, <laughs> uh, which um, I agree, and we 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 pontificate and and think of the right answers, and uh, in the end, I just come up but for Hashem, um, who who has all the answers. Um, so yes, we want to open up to some questions, um, and just uh, before that, um, I see Gail's got a hand up, and anybody else who'd like to make a comment or ask a question please put your hand up using the reactions button and when we finish at 5 30 we'll spend some time um, uh, afterwards for those who'd like to stay on for some prayer time and in particular um, i've been asked by the um, ambassador amir mamon to australia uh, to pray for the uh, lebanese christians who are getting slaughtered at the moment um, by Hezbollah. And he's very concerned and, uh, you know, he's raised the flag from his intelligence that the um, the Christian church and the Christian people in Lebanon are really, really getting hit very hard. So we'll bring that for, for prayer after 5.30. So, but Gail, good to see you with us again. You've got your hand up, please unmute and ask a question or make a comment. Yes, thank you. Um, thanks for everything you did today. Um, just a quick question. Um, I do follow what I can about every everything the IDF has to face. Um, I'm just wondering about the status of underground tunnels from Lebanon into Israel, if they've all been discovered of late. I hope so. <laughs> 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 we, we don't know. We don't know if they're there until until we know they're there. Um, the the soil and the earth in say Gaza is is sandy and sandstone, and it's very easy to dig tunnels. Um, whereas the the geology of northern Israel is is different, um, and so it's harder to dig tunnels. There were a couple of tunnels discovered a couple of years ago. I think three entering Israel. Israel, from memory, destroyed two and has sort of kept one open to sort of show journalists and visiting visiting politicians and stuff. Um, I mean, I hope there's no tunnels. Certainly, that was that was the threat. Um, you know, the the what Hamas did on the seventh of October was widely seen as a Hezbollah plan, and Hezbollah had sort of wanted to do something similar. That is to enter Israel um, and and take and retain a part of Israel and, and you know, murder Israelis as they, as they went along. Um, one would presume that in the ensuing nine months, Israel has, you know, doubled its efforts to discover tunnels. There's sophisticated, you know, tools, seismic tools, this, that. Um, who knows what they have? So I, I don't know. I haven't, to, I, guess, I guess the answer is I haven't seen in the news in any recent times that they've discovered any tunnels but hopefully that means there's none okay thanks so yeah. much it's um good news and a blessing about the hard soil amen yeah. Uh, yeah. Be thank you thanks Gail. um now just before joanna i see jack's got his hand up so um physically so we'll give you a, a turn first jack uh thank you john and and just following up on something you said about the Christian community in Lebanon being slaughtered. Uh, that leads me on to broadening the whole discussion, really, as uh, because to me, this seems to be the beginning of a really major confrontation between East and West. Or, for example, um, when you hear English-born Islamic preachers say, we will have Sharia law, I don't think the West has appreciated how dangerous this is. Um, and until they do, there'll be problems and we need to prepare for it, um, that all people are threatened with what is going, what is really a, 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 almost a, a minor squirmish in the Middle East. Brent, yeah, it's a good, your comment? Yeah, it's a good, good point. 
brain? Um, I think in all of these things, there is a spectrum of, of thought and of motivations. Um, there are without doubt um, imams and other Muslims in the West that say that, you know, there will be eventual, um, uh, you, you know, eventual global domination of Islam. There's been in the paper in the last couple of weeks, um, a, a international group called Hizb al-Tahriya, which is a um, arguably a non-violent Islamist hate group that that wants to form a global caliphate and take over the world. Um, so they're, they're out there. Um, but it's hard. And, and when people, when, when people make statements like that, they, you know, it gets into the media or, or people become aware of it and it becomes hard to know the sentiment that they reflect. You know, do they reflect 1% of Muslims, 0.1% of Muslims or 90% of Muslims? You know, it, it's hard. And so, so A, it's hard to, to know, but B, I think it's very important not to, um, you know, not, not to think, or not to cast aspersions over all Muslims. I know plenty of Muslims. I've gone out drinking beer with Muslims, both in, in the West Bank and, and here in Australia. You know, uh, you're not supposed to drink alcohol if you're a Muslim, right? So th there's a whole spectrum of Muslim thought. Um, um, there's a whole, there's a whole um, complexity in, in, in the same way that Israel is, you know, most of the people on this call know Israel very well. We would rail against anyone that wants to make Israel appear monolithic because we know that Israel is complex. Same thing goes for Palestinian society, for Australian Muslim community and so on and so forth. Um, but to get to your point, there is a threat in that there are people in the Australian Muslim community, in, in certainly in, in Middle Eastern Muslim communities that do want um, an Islamic caliphate over the world. Um, and there are some people that want to use violence in order to achieve this Islamic caliphate and so on and so forth. Um, but I'm very confident... I am confident that these people represent a very small fraction of, say, the Australian Muslim community. And I'm also very confident that Australia's security agencies are keeping a very close eye on them. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Or... Yeah, but it's a good, it's an observation. And it's something that we think and pray about as well. Um, and we won't go further. Just into that I just moment. wanted... I just wanted to comment because I was a little bit involved in the end of the 70s and early 80s. I want to comment the Australia. The Australia absorbed the thousands of uh, Christian Lebanese uh, from the southern part of Lebanon along the years, and especially between the years 82 and 2000, uh, when Israel was uh, working together with uh, the leader of the Falangis, you know, in, in southern Lebanon, Major Haddad. And uh, by the way, Israel is taking care of people who helped us in the southern Lebanese part uh, uh, in, in, in an amazing way, finding jobs for them until today. If someone is a truck driver and he lost his job, uh, his Israeli uh, counterpart is calling uh, friends uh, to help uh, finding jobs. Israel shows dedication to the southern Lebanese uh, Christian Maronite community uh, very, very much so closely uh, along the years. And Australia is, is amazingly welcoming uh, the Maronites, especially to the Sydney uh, area. Yeah. Thanks, Etan. Um Joanna's had a hand up for a while, so please uh, ask your question, Joanna, or make a comment, and then we'll finish off with that. Brian, thank you. I've really enjoyed both your talks. Um, just quickly, um, the, do you see a possibility for the Lebanese Christians to be absorbed into Israel, obviously through a safety corridor being established on a temporary basis? And also, what about the Druze community that that obviously is stationed in the three nations. Do you see any um, anything specially being done for the Druze? The Druze 
a reason to answer because they are always very loyal to the country in which they live, um, which is why Israeli Druze serve in the Israeli army and Lebanese Druze are loyal to Lebanon. It's interesting that the Golani Druze still see themselves as Syrian, uh, mm -hmm. and so they're, they're loyal to Syria, um, which is a bit complex. But but no, so, so the Druze won't be absorbed into Israel or anything. I, I personally can't see Lebanese Christians being absorbed into Israel. Um, I mean, you know, never say never, but um, the, the South Lebanese Christians that Israel took into Israel in 2000 were people directly associated with the South Lebanese army, which was the Israeli in order to but the South Lebanon now, I can see them being absorbed. I don't know. Um, thanks, thanks, Brent. I'm, I'm not sure if that that was my internet dropped out a bit or your internet dropped out a bit. <laughs> Um, we, oh, we... sorry. I, I something came up saying my internet was unstable. Did you? Did I cut out? Did I? You, you just yeah. You were intermittent, so we got part oh. of the answer. I want right. just to add uh, to Brent's uh, message here, very very strong message about the loyalty of Jews uh, wherever they are to the to the sovereign country, and I think this is very important to mention. I think it would be worthwhile if you can find or Google. An Israeli movie, um, the Syrian bride, is about a very complicated situation where a Druze, a lady from uh, the Golan Heights, where you were visiting with me along uh, the way many, many times, John, uh, is uh, match made with uh, with uh, Druze on the other side of the border and uh, the complications around it would be really much uh, feeding. Uh, um, we'll send that movie out then with a, with a copy of the recording and what's yes. happening next week. So, yes, yes. So we just want to say thank you very much, Dr. Bryn Khalil. Um, it was uh, great, um, it's wonderful to have a, um, your perspective on different aspects of the war. And as we like to get both sides of the stories uh, whether we have our own personal point of view, which mine, by the way, is I can't ever see a, a two-state solution being a solution. That's me personally. But well, other... record, my, my PhD in my book had a subtitle called An Impossible Peace. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I can't see it happening, but um, but, but, but unfortunately, I think all, it, of the it, other, all of the other alternatives are, um, are uh, less chance or a worse outcome. Yeah, and I will, I will send John and I will send you uh, the uh, column written by the author A. B. Yoshua uh, to speak about why uh, his opinion is uh, matching probably with you and with uh, Brian and all of us. It's a it's a long way to Tipperary, as we say. <laughs> On that note, we'll say thank you and our official part of the meeting will conclude. We'll conclude the um, uh, recording. We'll be sending you out the invite for next week with a special guest um, from, from the possible Palestinian point of view, um, which will be very interesting. But from this point of view, we release those who need to be released. And for those who would like to stay, we'll have a short break with a music segment and then we'll come back for some time of discussion and prayer and thank you so much dr Bryn carlin